thanks for having me and thanks for the introduction. Um, great to see so many friendly faces out here in such a large group of people. Um, I'm going to be talking about a couple of my favorite things that I get to do for my job. Um, so one is working with Lewis's Woodpeckers, and we have a couple different research projects um, that we have had the past mm, three years or so. Digging into Lewis's Woodpecker Habitat Associations in the East Cascade ecoregion, and then also starting to tease apart uh, their migratory patterns, both in Oregon and then a larger uh, patterns across the West. Um, so, like I mentioned, one of my favorite things is Lewis's Woodpeckers, and you don't have to talk to me about my work for very long but until <laughs> I start talking about these birds. Kind of a joke among my agency. Um, <laughs> And then the other thing that I really love um, that I've been able to participate in in the past few years is modus tracking technology. And we will dig into that uh, in this talk as well. So stay with me. We've got a lot of, a lot of different topics that we're going to be touching on. So first off, um, just to chat through what really makes this species interesting um, and unique. So lucid woodpeckers, um, they are classified as woodpeckers, but in a lot of ways, they don't behave as one. You know, we think of uh, hairy woodpeckers and pileated woodpeckers as having these extremely robust bills and boring into wood, and that's the way they forage. And lucid woodpeckers, they're not, they're not built quite that way. If you just look at their body structure, you can see they look different. They don't have quite as robust bills. Um, they have really acrobatic flight patterns. And this is because the way that they forage is they capture insects on the wing. So they forage a lot more like a flycatcher or a swallow, um, which makes them super interesting for a woodpecker, but also really difficult to capture. <laughs> um, and because they're aerial insectivores, a couple of key habitat characteristics that are tied with that is they need an abundance of insects on the breeding ground. Um, so in the spring and summer, their main food source are insects. In the winter time, their main food source is acorns. And that's how why I'm here today talking. Um, so because of that, they <clears throat> if they don't have those two food sources, they need to migrate. Um, and then the other uh, habitat characteristic from the human history trade is that they require a much more open canopy than we see typical to woodpecker species because they need to be able to dodge and dive and fly around and catch those insects and also be able to outline the site to see the insects to be this prey. Um, another interesting characteristic of the, this woodpecker is unlike pileated woodpeckers, um, a secondary cavity nest. So that means they don't typically create their own homes. They contract out a worker to come in and build their home for them. Um, and then they go in and they inhabit that cavity. So the habitat trait that's tied to that is that typically um, we're looking for an area that has an abundance of snags with soft wood if they're going to be able to do any sort of um, you know, remodeling <laughs> to that cavity. Uh, so we need decaying wood, we need standing snags um, for their habitat characteristics. And then um, Lewis's woodpeckers are known as burn specialists. And a few of those habitat characteristics that I've been talking about, so open canopy, abundance of insects, abundance of snags. I know you all know quite a bit about fire. And is it starting to kind of click together how this might be a burn associated species? And if that's not enough to kind of have that come into your head, just look at the bird. Um, it has this iridescent green black um, coloring on its back and its wings. And if you look at that charred wood up there, it's really similar. So clearly they have been evolved to exist in these um, landscapes with burns on the landscape. Um, however, despite an increasing fire regime and larger scale intensity fires in the last 50 years, Lewis's woodpeckers have experienced about a 50% decline range wide. So there's something missing. 
Clearly, just large-scale intense burns are not creating the correct <laughs> habitat for lucid woodpeckers. So they're not just burn specialists. They're something in a burn <laughs> specialist. And that's what we were, we were really trying to figure out about this species. So to just give a large overview um, about their range in the West, um, you can see this rainbow of different colors. And the big takeaway from here is that they range across most of the Western US uh, throughout some portion of their annual cycle. And that's what all those different colors uh, mean. And then if we zoom into Oregon, um, you can see we still have a rainbow of different colors. And this shows us that Lewis's woodpeckers are using different habitat in the state for, for, for a variety of different periods of their annual cycle. And then most of Eastern Oregon, which is where I work in study, is that red color, which is breeding season. So they're here, they need those insects, um, and then they migrate elsewhere for winter time. And that makes sense because most of Eastern Oregon doesn't have oaks and acorns for them to eat in the winter. However, we have this really unique blob um, in North Central Oregon, which I'm sure you are all well acquainted with that purple blob. Um, <laughs> and that is a uh, year round habitat for Lewis and woodpeckers. And it's believed um, that that is the only remaining residential population of Lewis and woodpeckers in the state. So there is a little bit of blue purple blob down in Southwest Oregon, um, but that's actually changed that it's no longer believed that those are residential birds and they just overwinter in southwest Oregon. Um, so it, and, and we want to understand what's unique about um, north central Oregon and the oak habitats there to understand why these birds um, are continuing to exhibit uh, residential habitat or residential patterns and try to look at the um, differences in that southwestern oak habitat and this habitat to try to figure out how do we keep these birds here year round? How do we keep this really unique population um, and stronghold for the species when the species is in such great decline? So again, <laughs> just to re reiterate at home, um, we have seen quite large habitat declines across the state of Oregon uh, for this species. So you can see comparing um, the map in the upper left from 1850 uh, to the habitat map in 2011, most of the habitat in Western Oregon for this species is gone. Um, and then across the board, we've seen declines in quality of the habitat for this species. So this is really a huge priority for my agency to try to figure out um, where we can strategically conserve habitat and keep these remaining populations strong. Um, so species status, like I mentioned, about a 50% range-wide decline in the last 50 years. This has triggered um, my agency to um, create this species as an organ conservation strategy species. And it's actually our top priority species for work in the Columbia Plateau in the East Cascades ecoregion. So we, well, if we jumped across the river, we would sit in the East Cascades ecoregion in Oregon, and the Columbia Plateau is um, the to the north and east, or to the direct east, I guess. Um, so this species is a very high priority for um, work for my agency. And then it's also a federal species of concern. Um, and this has driven us, and the steady decline of this driven of the species has driven us, you know, to really need to fill in the knowledge gaps on habitat characteristics as well as annual use patterns um, to better conserve and manage the species. So, in order to do this and fill in some of the data gaps that we have. ODFW par partnered with um, Cal Poly Humboldt, which I always mess up because they're a Humboldt state forever, and I just cannot get it out of my head. Um, and we funded a couple grad students through Pittman-Robertson funding. Um, and our student, Brittany, she just defended her work on this project last spring and is in um, 
pro progress for a publication. So look forward to a publication coming probably within a year, hopefully. Um, and uh, I'm gonna just touch on the highlights of that work. So we had two different study sites. Uh, one was here in White River Wildlife Area. Um, that's the North Central Star on the map. And then down a little bit more south into Deschutes National Forest. And these were selected because they both represent breeding habitat uh, within the state of Oregon, but they are a little bit different. Um, White River Wildlife Area, of course, has a presence of oaks, and Deschutes National Forest is kind of more um, of that traditional breeding habitat that we see across eastern Oregon. Additionally, they both, both of these sites have um, a diversity of different uh, wildfire burns, both in age and severity. So we set up monitoring plots in different um, burn locations and did um, habitat metrics in, within those plots and then also point count routes to look at Lewis's woodpecker abundance. Um, and just to touch on the historic wildfire regime in this area, um, it was typically a return interval of about 10 to 25 years um, in, in these two study sites. So uh, fairly, you know, fairly recent or high frequency fire on the landscape. Um, and then we, in those habitat plots, we drilled into a few different post-fire habitat characteristics. So we wanted to um, correlate snag size and density, canopy cover, age and severity of fire. And then we also really wanted to dig into spatial co configuration of fire um, because fires on the landscape right now are much more homogenized than we would have seen historically. We're seeing really uniform high intensity burns across the landscape. Um, that's creating a pretty homogenous um, habitat type. And we wanted to dig in and see if there was anything within that piece um, that we could make management recommendations. So uh, to describe what you're looking at here, this graph, um, the dashed line at zero is kind of like your keystone of um, what to compare these different uh, plot runs on. So that is no effect. The dashed line is no effect at zero. Anything to the left of that dashed line is gonna have a negative association with the abundance of Lewis's woodpeckers. And anything to the right of that line is gonna have a positive association with Lewis's woodpeckers. Um, the bars that are dark, darker in black are statistically significant. And then the grayscale ones are ones that overlap that center line um, and are not statistically significant. So when looking at snag densities and size, um, we did see that positive association, which you can see with the top Lewis's woodpecker, with the, dens the density of snags and the presence of larger snags, which you can see with that lower Lewis's woodpecker. And then not only that, but we were able to tease out um, of that <coughs> snag density an optimal um, um, metric of snag density per hectare for Lewis's woodpecker abundance. Um, and we found that to be right around 58 snags per hectare. Um, and this is really interesting because although higher snags on the landscape and larger snags on the landscape is well documented in the literature for Lewis's woodpeckers, um, the previous snag density that's been reported was between 200 to 400 snags per hectare. Mm -hmm. So that is much different um, than our findings. So that shows that Lewis's woodpeckers, so there had not been an assessment for the East Cascades in Oregon for Lewis's woodpecker habitat. So we didn't really have anything locally to compare that number to. And this shows that they're pretty plastic across their, their range. And we know this about them. We know that they, don't show high site fidelity um, in their migration patterns. Uh, they are pretty opportunistic with burns and with you know, wildfire on the landscape that is advantageous to a burn specialist. Um, however, <laughs> this is a really you know, large difference. And it's of note that 
the the sites that did have a higher um, snag density, so in that 200 snags per hectare range, no Lewis's woodpeckers were actually seen in those plots. So, and we ranged across you know, different um, ages and different burn severities. So clearly this, you know, this is the actual, you know, this wasn't a mistake. <laughs> this is something that the data is showing us um, that the Lewis's woodpeckers here prefer a lower snag density. So in relation to canopy cover, uh, the plot's gonna be read similarly. Um, no surprise here. Uh, a, a higher live tree density means less Lewis's woodpeckers on the landscape. And with the background information that we have on the species, that makes sense. The more live trees you have, the more difficult it is to see, um, you know, the more difficult it is to move around. And Lewis's woodpeckers were more abundant in burn sites than on burn sites in White River wildlife area, despite snag densities being the same. So that also shows um, that they're per they are selecting for burn locations. So they are proving true to their name <laughs> that they uh, are burn specialists. Um, however, like a limiting factor for the unburned sites within White River wildlife area was likely the higher levels of canopy cover. Um, so there were larger live trees in the unburned sites and the, um, the burn site, and this would hinder that flight catching behavior. And this really highlights the importance of fire management, such as prescribed burning, to maintain those open forests um, without large scale wildfire events coming through. And then finally, uh, the metrics of uh, burn age, severity, and spatial configuration. Um, our results show that Lewis's woodpecker will use burn areas less as they age, and that's what that uh, graph with the increasing over uh, to the center line is showing. Um, and this is most likely due to understory and live tree regeneration in older burn. So higher abundances, which is about 43% more Lewis's woodpeckers, were observed in burns that occurred within the last seven years. So they really do like um, newer burns on the landscape. Uh, and seven was about the sweet spot that we found to kind of have that cut off. Um, and this was despite snag density being the same in burns at different ages. So it really is something about those newer burns that is creating um, the perfect habitat beyond just the present snags. So, Contrary to other studies, um, our model indicated that fire severity overall actually did not have an effect on the species. So we can see that um, with the last line on the graph on the left, um, where it's kind of like smack dab in the middle that there, uh, there was no effect of burn severity. But when we tease it apart, um, looking at spatial configuration, like I chatted on before about the homogenized high intensity burns on the landscape, um, there was a significant effect of connected moderate burns on the landscape. So we did see when we looked at um, connectivity of burn across the landscape that they are definitely selecting against low intensity burns and then preferring moderate over high intensity. Um, so that's also another really interesting piece to tease out and kind of alludes to the fact that this is a species that is going to require um, a little bit of additional management um, in, um, you know, with whatever treatments that we have, we're going to have to specifically try to pick some metrics um, and get those Goldilocks conditions to really um, get breeding Lewis's woodpeckers in an area. So kind of the take home um, points that we, we drew from our study was that use prescription burning to keep open canopy on old burn areas. Um, so in forests that have burned 20 plus years ago, um, prescription burning is a really great tool to clear out shrub and live tree regeneration, which is going to create um, a more open landscape, which is going to um, 
cause Lewis's woodpeckers to be more likely to use that area during the breeding season. And then because of our discrepancy between snag densities and the snag densities of others, um, we suggest that land managers um, have a variety of different snag densities on a property. So kind of look at it as a mosaic. Um, so you're having some areas, and if you get a really good moderate burn, go for that 58 snags per hectare in that moderate burn, because that's going to be, you know, money for breeding the Mrs. Woodpeckers. That's going to be what they want. But try to look at the landscape as a whole and have some um, have some locations on the property that do have higher snag density, because then over time, as the property ages, you'll end up at that Goldilocks spot through succession. Um, you know, snags are going to fall down. <laughs> they're they're going to um, you won't have the same density. So if you have some sp spots with varying different snag density, you will just naturally get back at, to that um, sweet spot. Um, and that will also mean that you have to do less active management over time. Um, and then another point is to maintain those large snags because the about 40 centimeters DDH, um, what is the preferred nesting size for uh, these woodpeckers. And one aspect that we hope to tease out of this study, but didn't end up being statistically significant, was that there wasn't a difference between breeding Lewis's woodpecker abundance at White River Wildlife Area versus the Deschutes National Forest sites. Um, obviously, there are habitat differences there. Um, and this warrants more studies of trying to understand um, what the unique characteristics are of White River Wildlife Area, or what those unique oak characteristics are uh, that provide that year-round habitat for this species. And our, this study was not really designed to get really well at that piece. Um, one limiting factor was the oak classification layer that we were using was not um, adequate to really classify what was occurring on the landscape um, when this unit was out ground truthing um, sites. Uh, and what really needs to be done to understand this is to track individual birds, look at um, habitat usage during different portions of the annual cycle, um, and compare home range sizes so that we can understand how they're utilizing this landscape across an entire annual cycle or across an entire year. And that gets us to our next study. Um, again, we've partnered with Cal Poly Humboldt uh, to fund a grad student through an Oregon Conservation and Recreation Fund grant to look exactly at those questions. So we want to look at home range size in breeding season versus wintering season of these residential birds. Um, look at seasonal habitat utilization and try to figure out if birds are moving around or if birds are moving out of the area and different birds are coming in. We honestly don't know. <laughs> um, and then because we use modus tracking technology, which don't worry, I will explain more on that coming up. Um, we're not only able to look at um, fine scale telemetry that gives us home range sizes and habitat utilization, but also more large scale migratory strategies. And then we'll show a little video on this. We've been waking up at 3.45 in the morning to get ready. We put basically a embroidery hoop with a bag on it to a cavity that has um, eggs or nestlings. Once I got that hoop on the bag, come on up close. And then we hope by morning time, um, when the sun comes up, the bird will leave the cavity and get captured. And then we can put the tag on, color bands, measurements, all this stuff that um, is pretty unique for the woodpeckers. They haven't been captured very many times, so we're learning all this information from basic, how big are they here, to where do they go. 
We are here at White River Wildlife Area studying the Lewis's woodpecker. They are a green and red woodpecker found in the area, a very unique species. Um, we're doing this in partnership with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and Cal Poly Humboldt, um, together working to try and understand this population here at White River because they're special. The tagging project at White River um, is funded by an Oregon Conservation and Recreation Fund grant looking at locally um, home range sizes of these tagged birds and how they associate with different habitats there. And then at a larger scale, um, it's believed that these woodpeckers at White River Wildlife Area, some amount of that population is residential and it's the only residential population remaining in the state of Oregon. Our crew has been working to capture Lewis's woodpeckers and put small um, radio tags on them that help track their movement and will help us understand their migration. So the population here um, is the only year-round population found in Oregon. There are Lewis's woodpeckers nesting in other areas of Oregon, but here is special, so they spend winter here as well. And so some migrate, they leave the area, some stay, and we want to understand what the drivers are to why they stay and why they go. So this is an important species because we do live in an altered disturbance regime and that is probably one of the reasons that we're seeing decline in this species because we have seen that alter and we're not seeing, we're seeing dramatic wildfire events that, you know, wipe out all habitat and we're not seeing that kind of really great middle ground that this species needs of naturally occurring um, slow burning fires um, that, that exist on the landscape. So Lewis's woodpeckers are commonly associated with uh, naturally occurring wildfire burns. Uh, they use those because they're not your typical woodpecker. They have a less robust bill, so they're not able to drill into trees that um, normal species of woodpeckers would be able to, which means it's difficult for them to create their own cavity. So they either have to try to find an abandoned cavity from a different species that can drill that cavity for them, or they have to have uh, decayed uh, wood and snags to be able to make those cavities in those nests to rear their young. Additionally, um, when you have a fire, you typically have a lot of regrowth that might be, you know, you open up the canopy so you're able to see more shrubs and forbs, and those all make insects, which is great for the Lewis's woodpeckers because they're insectivores, so they're eating those flying insects. They primarily forage, in the summer at least, by flying around beautiful um, maneuvers, very, very good at flight. And many times you'll see them with mouths full of insects to bring to nestlings in their cavities um, to deliver to them. So we see that a lot. Um, and they'll do that mostly. And then in the winter, they'll eat acorns. So not like a woodpecker, like a hairy woodpecker you might see pecking into a tree and we are monitoring those cavities. So we have over 50 cavities that are active nests this summer here at White River. And we're monitoring them every couple of days using a camera system that we can reach up to 52 feet tall. And we've got nests that are just about above my eye height, so about six feet tall. So there's a variation. Um, and we look in with the camera and we get to count how many nestlings they are, see them grow from basically little, what I call gummy bears, they're pink, they can't hold their heads up to um, big, bright-eyed um, fledglings that are about to fly. And we've even captured a few of them to try and figure out what their movement behavior is like. So by putting tags on birds, we can understand, um, we tagged these birds in the breeding season and we can understand, okay, they're here in the breeding season. Is there a time where they leave for the winter? We can also look at um, their, their use of habitats during the summertime and if that differs from the use of habitats during the winter time. So this, this project is really um, wonderful to get at some of our key data gaps on this species so that we can manage it better across the state.
so we can see their flying. It's for hanging in there for <laughs> technology difficulties and figuring that out for me. I just think that the imagery of that video is really beautiful to um, get at what we're, what we're talking about with aerial insectivores and some of the what the habitat looks like um, that we see them breeding. Um, so I've been promising you this whole talk that we would talk about MODIS. Um, and now is the time. So historically, it's been really difficult to study small wildlife uh, for a variety of different reasons. Um, the animals are too small to carry traditional tags or collars that we would see. Um, if you've ever seen like an elk collar, really large. And if you think about putting something like that on a bird or a bat or even an insect, um, we have certain size percentages that we have to stay within that makes it extremely difficult for researchers to study um, these migratory animals. Additionally, traditional methods are very time intensive, uh, so they require reciting efforts for banding. That means that we have to have people all across the landscape watching for band recites. Um, it's just kind of like finding a needle in a haystack and can be, you know, very difficult to pick up stopover sites. We have a better chance of finding overwintering sites because they stay in one spot longer and it's more likely to be able to recite bands. But that in between those migratory corridors that we know are really important are very difficult to accurately delineate. Um, and it's cost prohibitive. So there is technology that exists to put tiny little GPS tags on these birds. But it's so extensive that for researchers to have a robust enough study size, um, sample size, uh, we would, it, it's just, it, it's not in the budget. So we can't, we can't do that. And bonus checks a lot of the boxes um, for these issues. Um, it's a small tag that are small enough to put on insects even. They have sap or um, Solar panels on them, which gives them a much longer lifespan, so we can get multiple seasons of data from them. Um, and they're really great at delineating migratory uh, corridors across the landscape. But there are two components. So one, this is the tag that we deploy on the animal, and then there's towers that are um, installed across the landscape. So the tag is kind of like a traditional radio tag that we use on, uh, you know, have used for a long time. And then the tower is emitting a unique signal uh, for MODIS that when an animal with that uh, MODIS signal flies past a tower, and if it flies within a 15 kilometer radius, the MODIS tower picks up the signal, records it with the unique ID, and then uploads it to a website that the researcher can then go on and say, okay, my species was, or my individual was in this spot at this time. And then if you have enough towers on the landscape, you can get a really good idea of where the um, individual or the species are going. And the types of tower vary to co-located co towers on permanent buildings with internet and power to pop-up towers um, that can be in more remote areas. And stations across the U.S., you can see there's a yellow dot, um, definitely more skewed towards the East Coast, but the West is starting, definitely starting to build out the network. And then current stations in the Pacific Northwest, um, but focusing in on Oregon, dots of yellow, and then the ones that ODFW have partnered on is with a private research ranch from the Bitterroot Valley of Montana. Um, they were wanting to look at uh, the migratory corridor of Lewis's woodpecker <laughs> that are breeding in western Montana. They believe that they were dropping down to that cluster of dots um, in the Boise area, but they tagged 30 birds and none of them came through. So they approached us and said, hey, would you like to partner on this? Uh, we think they might be coming through the Blue Mountains. And we partnered to install uh, four different towers on Forest Service and state land. And then additionally, the BLM funded um, six towers with Good Neighbor Authority grant money uh, throughout the Klamath Basin, two at White River, and then one at Saudi Island. And kind of giving an idea of what the White River Wildlife Area stations look at, we have one on postage stamp butte and one up above Smock Prairie in that um, recent burn footprint. And um, those are both those pop-up tower type um, style towers. 
to have a solar panel and a modem um, that um, means that they can pick up signal all year round if we service them about once a year. So to dig into some of the results um, from our tagging effort at White River Wildlife Area, uh, we tag, were able to tag nine birds throughout the breeding season this year uh, from June, the beginning of June to the beginning of July. Um, migration started in mid-September and lasted less than a week, which is pretty amazing. And interestingly enough, but kind of unfortunate for our study, <laughs> all nine birds migrated. <laughs> so we believe that that population was primarily residential and all nine birds that we were able to tag are not residential. Um, so that we obviously know that there are Lewis's woodpeckers there year round, but clearly the birds that we were able to tag are not there year round. Um, so this just means that we need to do a little bit more study and we're hoping um, we have more tags to deploy and we're hoping to tag some birds that over overwinter there this fall and winter. Uh, so that we can get some information on how birds move around that area in the fall and winter, even if they're not the same birds. Um, yeah, so stay tuned for more information. Do you understand this? So this was uh, just this 2024 yep. season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a terrible acorn year. Mm -hmm. Does that have some bearing on whether birds, will they change up their life history? So some of these were uh, actual birds. So they probably wouldn't know the difference between a good acorn year and a bad acorn year. Um, we don't know. That's something that we, you know, would like to use this information to tease apart is this, do these birds change their migratory strategies based on the mass year? And that's something that we can do because we have towers at White River now. These came anytime they're at White River every day. <laughs> So we can pick up when do they leave, when do they come back, do they come back, do they turn into you know residential individuals at some point? So it's a really it's a really cool piece of technology that we're able to use and um, yeah, be able to understand more about these birds. And then looking largely at Lewis's woodpeckers um, in the towers in Oregon and especially the towers that we put on the landscape really specifically for uh, Lewis's woodpecker migration tracking, those birds that were tagged in Western Montana um, that they believe went down through Boise. You can see a few birds do drop down um, the valley there, but the majority of birds come across the Blue Mountains uh, to the Klamath Basin and then drop down, uh, either go over to Southwestern Oregon to overwinter or drop down into California. So this technology is helping us to delineate migratory corridors, which are extremely important for um, us to conserve because you can't conserve a species unless you understand its full annual cycle. It's kind of like playing poker without a full hand of cards. Uh, if we don't know what they're doing in between their breeding and overwintering, we can't fully know what the, why the plants could be occurring. And that's what I've got for you today. Um, I don't know if I have any time for questions. <laughs> okay.